What's up, everybody? It's Justin. Welcome to another episode of the Clovis Culture Podcast. Just kidding. This is not a podcast yet. It'll be a podcast tomorrow. Right now, it's just a plain old Ask Me Anything. Ask Me Anything number 70. That's a lot. 70 weeks is a long time. I'm no mathematician, but it's like three years or something. Also, I'm late, a couple minutes late, because I keep forgetting that I have this big, fancy, crazy Instagram now, and um, I have the swipe up feature, which is really cool, so I try to go on Instagram and let everyone know, like, hey, come over to Facebook, swipe up, it'll bring you over to Facebook, you can be in the Ask Me Anything, it'll be really cool, we can be friends and stuff, right? And I always forget about that, I'm like, ah, it's 801, and I have to do an Instagram real quick, so I just did an Instagram. Anyway, that's why I'm a couple minutes late. Really sorry about that. Super excited about tonight. I have some great questions. You guys went to ama.iamclovis.com. Let me say the website again for the podcast listeners. ama.iamclovis.com. Go there. Ask me stuff. <laughs> and they're awesome questions. I'm super excited. Um, I, I probably am not going to get to all of them that I got today. Fair warning. Um, plus, some of you do this thing where you're like, hey, here's my AMA question. It's 14 questions in one, bro. Have fun, and those 14 questions are not at all related. <laughs> not not even a little bit. It's like, boo, 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 squirrel, hey, mm, squirrel. Mm, and I'm like, whoa, what were you doing when you answered this question? How many cups of coffee did you have before you asked me this one question that's 14 questions of unrelated things? Also, in other news, we did the first ever Clovis Client testimony podcast with the amazing Annika Nosiainen, and I can say her name really well now, and I feel super fancy about it. Um, my dad and I were just having a conversation like an hour ago. We were like, we just love Annika. We just love her. She did a great job. She just embodies all things Clovis tribe, because that's what we are, everybody. We're the Clovis tribe. That's what we do, changing lives, one human life at a time to change the world. Exponential, right? I love all these happy faces and laughy faces and wow faces and loves and hearts. Click all the stuff. Oh, I always forget this too. Um, share. Click the share button. Let's see. Um, it's really weird when I'm live. It, it's limiting the amount of things that I can do here. That bothers me. My share button is gone. So you guys are going to have to share for me, okay? Yeah, this is weird. Share for me. Click the share button. Share to your timeline right now. What's up, everybody? What's up, Judy? What's up, Laura? What's up, Mike? How you doing, brother? What's up, Aaron? What's up, Shelly? What's up, Kimberly? Laura? Mike again. What's up, dude? <laughs> Carla, Stevie, Judy again. Jessica, share, 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 share. Yeah, everybody loved the Annika episode, right? It was, it was great. It was super cool. And it was fun because a lot of other people now want to do a Clovis Client Testimony podcast because I think when I announced it, I don't know what people thought it was going to be. It was going to be like a, like a pop quiz or something like, hello, Clovis Client. I'm Justin, your health coach. We've been talking via email for many weeks. Please describe to the people what muscle glycogen is. Right? It's not like that, everybody. It's not a quiz. It's just, it's literally like you're in my living room with me or my kitchen. I do all these for my kitchen. I like to chill in my kitchen. Um, but yeah, it's just a super fun conversation. It's like, like we're sitting in the living room and then all the other Clovis listeners and all the people who are non-Clovis, they get to just be flies in the wall and listen. You know, a lot of people are going to just listen to the episode and be like, wow, their, their whole lifestyle thing sounds really cool. Like, it's pretty cool. It's pretty fun. Life is pretty freaking fun once you figure out how to remove all these nonsense health obstacles that everybody deals with that aren't really, shouldn't really be obstacles at all, you know? Just simplifying life. Like she says in the clip I put on Instagram, just, she just gets to enjoy life more. That's all there is to it. So uh, check out the, the Annika episode. You can go to clovis.show slash Annika, A-N-N-I-K-A, clovis.show slash Annika. So check that out. Um, in other news, today's been great. Got a lot of work done. Uh, almost got to inbox zero. I swear I'm going to get to inbox zero one of these days. I don't know how it's going to happen. Had a great talk today with Paul Saladino, Mr. Carnivore. He's freaking awesome. Makes my brain hurt all the time. Dude is so smart. Uh, check out Paul's work. He's great. What's up, Stevie? What else we got here? Anna. Hey, what's up, Anna? What's up, Sean? All right. So let's dive into this thing. What do you guys think? Want to answer some questions and stuff? Again, yeah, let's do it. Click the share button, like I said. Click the happy face button. Click the smiley button. All of my controls seem to be completely gone. I can't do anything with them. Really interesting. I don't know why that's happened. But I got some questions, and we're going to answer them. Let's dive in. The first question has to do with one of my favorite things in the world, and that is squatting. And we're not talking about squatty potties, ladies and gents. We're talking about a good old-fashioned back squat with a whole bunch of weight, 
you get to be a meathead, right? Just like me. I did squats today, a lot of them. So let's talk about squats. Question one for AMA number 70 is, I was looking on the 5 by 5 website for proper squat form and was surprised to find that they recommend going below parallel. I've always been told to go down until your knees are 90 degrees and quads are parallel to the ground. So in your opinion, are your hips supposed to drop lower than your knees or do you recommend going to parallel? Good question. Somebody taught you how to squat wrong. Don't ask them for advice on stuff anymore. <laughs> so yes, I agree 100% with the Strongest website. If you guys have been to clovis.show slash MED for the uh, minimum effective dose episode I did called uh, uh, If You Don't Love Fitness, right? People just trying to learn as much as they can about fitness for overall maintenance, health, you know, general health and wellness really. Um, so yeah, I shared the strong lifts website because all their tutorials are fantastic. They, they have just massive pages of tutorials on how to do the major powerlifting movements. And when you squat, you have to break parallel 100%. You have to break parallel, right? Um, this is contrary to what a lot of people do in the bodybuilding world. I actually have an Instagram post got from years ago. Now I think I'm, I'm probably squatting like 225 or something. It's nothing crazy. Um, but my butt is, is clearly down lower than my knees and it's a picture from behind. And I put a super cheesy, like fitness influencer caption. That's like, if you're not breaking parallel, you're not squatting. Right. But I actually do. I stand by that. If you're not breaking parallel, you're, you're not squatting in my opinion. I, I really think that's, that's what it is. But the issue is in, in bodybuilding culture, it's become this thing of like, you know, bodybuilding uses blanket workouts. It's just like, oh, four sets of 10 of this, four sets of 10 of leg raises, quads, and four sets of 25 calf raises because the calf muscle is somehow different. No, it's, it's just kind of silly the way they do stuff. But anyway, the bodybuilding thing is just like complete the number of sets, complete the number of reps at any cost. It doesn't matter. Just make it happen. They don't really think about things like mobility for the most part there. I'm sure there are bodybuilders that do. I'm not making blanket statements about them, but go to any globo gym and you're going to see a lot of people squatting wrong 100%, right? So they just want to get their sets and reps in. But this is also why it drives me crazy. I've ranted about CrossFit before where like certain CrossFit instructors, like they'll take a 300 pound person who's never even done a back squat and hand them a barbell. I'm like, we're doing snatches today. Like what? That person doesn't have the mobility to sit down in a chair and stand up, you know, like that. No, no, we're not doing this. It's crazy. Right. But it becomes this thing of like, well, I want to squat. Um, so the, the breaking parallel issue, there are actually some trainers that will tell you it's dangerous. And that's, that's simply foolish. America, not Americans, human beings have been squatting for all of time, right? So the biggest thing that you have to do is work on mobility. If you haven't, yeah, I guess this is the way I put it. If you haven't spent any time on mobility, like proper squat form and proper squat mobility, then you probably don't even know what you can actually squat. And you're probably not even engaging your glutes. That's the real issue with it is you can do a squat where you don't break parallel and never engage your and never engage your your um your glutes never engage your butt muscles really that's the thing that's what's happening when you're not breaking parallel there's there's another uh meme i think i might have posted it at one point but it's like one of the dudes from jersey shore he's like yelling at the camera and it says of course you can squat four plates you don't break 45 degrees <laughs> you know like or something like that or like your knees aren't even bent or something like that it's just a lot of people bodybuilders think they can like squat 300 pounds when the reality is like if you put that same 300 pounds in the bar and you're like, okay, break parallel and squat for the same number of sets and reps, they couldn't do it with a gun to their head. I'm telling you, like if you've never done this, it's a completely different feeling and you have to engage those glutes. So what 99% of people do with squats, okay, here's a good example. Here's what drives me crazy. You've probably seen this. If you've been in a Globo gym or a CrossFit gym or anything, you've probably seen this and it drives me nuts. People do these little tweaks and cheats for their squatting, right? Because they're what they don't, they're making up for a lack of mobility, which is just silly. You're gonna hurt yourself doing this, right? So they won't break parallel. Or the thing I hate the most is watching people put plates under their heels. They put like 10 pound plates or five pound plates on the ground and stand their heels on them because they don't have proper ankle mobility. So they'll put they'll elevate their heels using plates and then they'll squat or they'll wear, wear suit and sh certain shoes with elevated heels for their squat. It's very similar to people like who use their recreational lifters and they're using weight belts. Like you don't need a weight belt. A weight belt is artificial support. 
right? You don't need that unless you're like a professional power lifter, like competing and you need to do like your biggest one rep map max of your life to like win the grand prize. You don't need a belt. You don't need to be doing that. What you're doing is compensating for things that your body can't do and you're going to get hurt. So with squatting, I think about it like this. If you can't stand barefoot, barefoot, feet shoulder width apart, or you know what? Let's take it further. Hip width apart. Put your feet hip width apart because that's going to make it even harder, right? Put your feet hip width apart, maybe shoulder width apart, and just squat down, like literally like ass to heels. I mean, like break parallel, like go down until your body stops going down, right? Your ass is like almost on the ground and sit there in a resting position. If you can't rest there, you probably shouldn't be doing weighted squats yet. There are ways to engage your glutes. There are ways to work those muscles without putting 200 pounds in your back and squatting with bad form. Because what happens when you squat with bad form, like if you're not breaking parallel, like I said, you're going to be putting most of that weight in your quads, your knees, and your lower back. And that's really not a good idea, okay? So this happens with men a lot because men, men in particular, really don't like to spend time on mobility. So they just go, I see that guy squatting 250 pounds. I'm going to squat 250 pounds. And they just put the weight in the bar and just scream through it and try to do whatever, right? You really, really can mess yourself up, particularly lower back injuries on squats. This happens a lot. And a lot of people just work their quads over and over. They never even engage their glutes. So you're missing the whole purpose of doing a squat. So long story short, yes, you need to break parallel 100%. If you can't break parallel or you can't break parallel weighted, then... Look up something like um, Kelly Starrett's Becoming a Supple Leopard is a great book for this. Um, GMB has a focused flexibility course that's really, really good for mobility. Manflow Yoga is great for this. My buddy Dean Pullman, work on the ankle mobility, do some, uh, uh, some pigeon pose stuff from like yoga and try to open up those hips and try to get to a point where you can do body weight squats comfortably. A great way to do this is kettlebells. Hold a kettlebell in front of you and do goblet squats with kettlebells. You can take a really light kettlebell, like a 35 pound kettlebell and do goblet squats and break parallel that way. Start with those kinds of things. You don't need a barbell on your back to work your glutes. You simply don't. And if you don't have the mobility to do it, you're gonna do more harm than good. So do other exercises that force you into the proper position. And a goblet squat is a great example of that. Look up a goblet squat, kettlebell goblet squat. Fantastic for working mobility to get you into the right squat position, okay? All right, let's see what else we got here. Ooh, what's up, hey Clovis family? Oh no, Mike, no, 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 no. When I start hitting the gym, what should we stick to? High rep, low weight? No, I never recommend that for anybody ever. We'll talk about it, cross that bridge when you get there, man. We know where you're at, you don't need to worry about this stuff yet. Um, what else we got? Yeah, Travis, that's fantastic, absolutely great, I love that. Um, three sets of five is beautiful, three to five sets of five, I love that, I usually recommend five by five for people who are inexperienced. Um, this, this low, believe it or not, low weight, high rep, you are much more likely to get hurt that way. Much, much, much more likely to get hurt that way. I'm telling you. So, uh, be careful with that. What else we got? Kristen, just jumping on at glutes. I just did an awesome glute activation program through redefining strength for anyone looking for a good glute program. I learned a lot about my booty. GMB is awesome too. Yeah. Um, and Dean, again, at Manflow Yoga, he has his, uh, strength foundations course, which is fantastic. Uh, Dean's strength foundation course might be my favorite thing that I've ever come across for proper activation of muscles. It's crazy. Little 30 minute yoga videos. And like, you're like spent by the end, just from activating muscles with nothing but body weight. It's, it's amazing, but it's really important. You need to learn how to activate these muscles. I would argue that most, I, uh, let's say most lifters really at this point, um, just, just don't know how to activate muscles and particularly people like, look, I'm seated right now. The average American sits for like 16 hours a day. Our glutes are dead. They're literally dead tissue. We don't know how to engage them. We simply don't, right? Most people don't. So you got to think about that. You need to learn to engage these muscles. People are just out there squatting. This happens with a lot of women. A lot of women are like, I've been squatting for months and my butt isn't bigger. Like they want a bigger booty. They're like, I want my booty to look good in yoga pants and I keep squatting and nothing's changing. Well, you're probably not activating your glutes. And again, you're going to end up in a situation where your butt doesn't grow, but your thighs do. And then you're just pissed off. You know, like I got these giant quads. I can't fit in my skinny jeans and I got no butt. Well, because you've been working your, your, your quads three times a week with your squatting and haven't been touching your glutes. You know, that's really tricky. So Joe, get a handle on that. What else we got here? All right. Um, 
we're going to talk about doms. So this is a good, good segue into this um, from the world of lifting into this thing called doms. So I'm going to read the question, then we'll explain what this is all about and who this really applies to, because it's not really everybody, in my opinion. Um, okay, question. I'm really curious about delayed onset muscle soreness. Doms. Is that soreness that takes... It's that soreness that takes up to a day to set in, lasts for a few, and it usually calms down as long as your body is warmed up and moving, but comes back once you get cold. People usually experience it after doing eccentric strength training or go way past what their body usually handles in a workout or activity. Does it have anything to do with an individual's inflammatory response? Salt level, levels, why is it something you won't don't feel immediately? This sounds like somebody Googled what is DOMS and then asked me a question. I think that's what just happened, um, which is awesome. Let's let's talk about DOMS. So DOMS is um, pretty much, I think, DOMS was really brought to the mainstream for the most part, I think. Um, I didn't hear people start talking about it until CrossFit was wildly popular. So a lot of people were getting DOMS, this delayed onset muscle soreness from CrossFit. Okay, they were overtraining, 100%. They were over overtraining. And now my argument would actually be not so much that they're overtraining is that they're under recovering, right? So this is an issue of not giving the muscle what it needs. That's really the way that I see it. So yes, okay, so to answer your questions directly, um, there's usually two main causes. Now, it's a buildup of lactate for sure. Like it's, it's, it's just the blood lactate concentration that is causing this doms thing to happen but in the same sense i almost don't even want to call call that number one that's what everybody will say well number one is number one everyone's going to say that it's just the buildup of lactate that is what doms is yeah like that's what the, where the soreness is coming from and everything but i would argue that first and foremost it's electrolytes and water intake it's a dehydration issue I think it is because why is the blood flow not working properly? Now, there's a couple of reasons why the blood flow isn't working properly, and we're going to get into those. Um, so think about it this way. Like this person put in their question that um, people talk about eccentric motion. They say that eccentric motion is really what causes DOMS. Arguable, yes. I mean, I think it's it's overall muscle working that's going to make this happen, but a lot of people do blame eccentric motion for this. So it's not a coincidence that eccentric motion is being blamed for things like DOMS and then eccentric motion is also a fantastic way to, to make muscle hypertrophy happen, like actually building muscle, really gaining muscle. A lot of people will focus just on eccentric movements um, if they're trying to build muscle, if they're in like a, a lean mass gain phase, right? So what's happening in the eccentric move is that the muscles are traumatized and it's the adaption to this, the, the adaptation to this force or resistance that you're, that you're putting on it that causes the muscle to change. Now, in the same time that that's happening, what can happen is the, the traumatized muscle can actually get these little trigger points, right? So like a knot in your muscles, let's say, like a trigger point, and these little trigger points can restrict blood flow. So this is the idea of why this is happening delayed, because it's not a full-blown restriction, like it's not cutting off blood, not cutting off blood flow to your muscles. If it did, you'd have a real problem, you'd have dead tissues on your hands eventually, right? So it's not completely cutting off blood flow, but these little trigger points are restricting blood flow slowly, thus delayed right? Does that make sense? So you have this restriction of blood flow. Now it's the blood flow that should be moving that lactate along, moving the lactate out of the muscle. But if you have these tiny little restrictions and blood flow is not what it should be, that blood pressure, that flow going through the muscle isn't what it should be, it's not going to remove that lactate in the same way. So now you have delayed onset muscle soreness. And if you've heard this term, when I say trigger points, like you've probably heard this if you've ever gotten a massage, right? So, um, I have, I believe firmly in massage. I think massage is wonderful. I think it's absolutely fantastic. I think all athletes, people who train a lot should really be, should really be looking into massage therapy and I love it. Um, I have a wonderful massage therapist here in Nashville that I can barely use anymore because I quit playing music and now I'm poor, <laughs> but I used to use her once a month for basically a maintenance session and then anytime I needed her because I'm a meathead in the gym. All the time I tweak something, blah, blah, blah in the gym. Like I don't practice what I preach and I lift way too much weight and I train too much and all these things and end up hurt. And I'm like, Lynn, please help me. My God, you need to fix my back. And she goes in and she's a miracle worker, right? It's wonderful. Um, also, if you're in Rhode Island, by the way, anybody out there who's in Rhode Island, I know there's a few of you, uh, give me a shout because I have a fantastic massage therapist there for you that does this kind of therapeutic work, trigger points and things like that. So if you're doing any kind of training there, he's worth driving to, um, give me a shout and I will give you the name of that 
massage therapist in Rhode Island because he's amazing and you can deal with trigger points. Um, but outside of the trigger points and the blood flow thing, the best way to beat doms, again, is not to get doms, right? We talk about this in jiu-jitsu. What's the best way to get out of a rear naked choke? Don't get put in a rear naked choke, right? So I want to start that prevention is the best way to handle this. That said, this doesn't really apply to a lot of the people watching and a lot of the people listening. It really should be a problem for virtually none of you inside of Clovis except for my professional athletes and then the the few people that are that are in there that are like me that train at the level the frequency that I do, train at the level that I do with the heavy, you know, guys like Travis or John, um, maybe Laura doing a lot of kettlebell stuff, you know. So people that train really hard, this could be a thing. But if you're sore for days after any workout, there's a problem. There's a problem there with your lifestyle. If you're sore after like, if you're sore for three days after a Pilates workout, we got other issues on our hands. There's lifestyle issues. There's skeletal muscle issues. There's a lot. We got to work on a lot there, right? But basically, you're probably not eating right and you're probably not recovering properly. That's all there is to it. So to give an example, like in my bodybuilder days when I was young, I was sore all the time. It's like I wanted to be sore. It showed me I was doing something, you know. But since I've lived a Clovis lifestyle, I have never experienced arms ever. And I train constantly and I train very hard, right? So for most listeners, this is probably a non-issue and, and really never will be an issue. But the few tricks that I have here is if you actually have DOMS, you want to increase blood flow. A couple of things that increase blood flow very well are very low intensity aerobic training. That's what this person put in the in their question, like as long as you're moving, right? But as long as you're moving at low intensity, like doing more high intensity stuff on top of DOMS is going to be very problematic. So I talk about aerobic threshold training a lot. That's a great idea. Just get the blood flowing. Very, very low intensity cardio or sauna. I love sauna, everybody. As you guys know, I have an infrared sauna in my house. It's 20 feet away from me right now. I love it. It's fantastic. Uh, I use sauna virtually every day, assuming that my schedule allows me to. So it's fantastic for recovery. And sleep. You gotta sleep, everybody. You gotta sleep. There's a lot of type A's out there doing CrossFit and heavy lifting and trying to you know, sleep five hours and then go run their company or work 80-hour work weeks or whatever. Not gonna work. It's not going to work, right? So recovery is everything. And then like I tell Clovis newbies, electrolytes, electrolytes, electrolytes. You need electrolytes. And I tell everybody you need to get at least three grams of sodium a day. And I have changed my mind, everybody. All my new plans going out right now when I talk to people, at least four grams a day. I bumped it a whole gram, up to four grams. I mean, at least four grams of sodium a day. I really mean that. If you're living a low-carb lifestyle, you need to do it. You really need to get those extra electrolytes in. And then we can talk about things like potassium and magnesium. But if you're training, if you're training heavy, you're probably looking at seven grams of sodium a day. You know, six or seven grams of sodium a day is not unusual. And it's not a bad idea. It's not gonna hurt you in any way, shape, or form. And it's gonna help that blood flow. It's gonna help you not get dehydrated to begin with. And I also want you to get at least that half your body weight in ounces of water. Like for sure, if you're training, you do need to follow. Um, the, those rules for water intake. And on top of the water intake, so you have water intake, you have your sodium intake, preferably potassium, magnesium. And the other thing is you just need to eat right, right? You need to be getting enough protein. Your muscles need protein. So DOMS can happen with somebody who's like following a strict keto diet. Where they're like, I'm not going to get more than 20% of my daily calories from protein. And I'm lifting crazy heavy all the time. Like, yeah, you, you might end up with some serious muscle soreness, right? So you got to worry about things like that. You need to get your intake right of protein. Now, if you know your lean body mass, like if you know your, your body fat percentage, you can figure this out. It's a little easier and just get one gram protein per pound of lean body weight. That's a really great idea. Um, if you don't know, you could do anywhere from 0.8 to 1.0 grams of protein per pound of body weight per day. So you want to get all of those things, particularly on a training day. Like if you do a crazy heavy lift, you need the electrolytes, you need the water, you need the protein, you need the sleep. Super important. All of these things, you have to recover properly. So it's not really an issue of the workout. It's an issue of the recovery, if that makes sense. So I hope that, que that answered your question about DOMS. And uh, speaking of protein, we're going to dive into another uh, uh, another meat-related issue here. But I'm going to take a look and see uh, if we have some comments. John, what's up, dude? How are you, man? Brittany, yep, I did CrossFit for five-plus years and don't anymore because my body couldn't handle the load. 100%. Yeah, we're in the same boat. Uh, same thing for me. I did uh, CrossFit usually six days a week. And I was still playing gigs till 3 or 4 in the morning and drinking a lot of booze and not eating quite well. I mean, well, 
Yeah, I was still, at that point, I was eating pretty well. I was eating paleo, but I was definitely drinking alcohol and staying up super late and playing gigs and training CrossFit six days a week. And my whole body got beat to shit. Everything was just, it was not good. Not good. So don't do it. Yeah, rhabdo is a little different. Rhabdo is uh, is different than Dom's, but we'll talk about rhabdo another day. It's, it's yeah, it's more serious, I guess you should say. What else we got? Kristen, get a BFF who is awesome in her PT field. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a great, yeah, my buddy in, in Rhode Island, one of my best friends in the world, uh, is a fantastic massage therapist. Let's just give him a shout out right now. Nick Browning. Nicholas, Nick Browning. He's amazing. Freaking amazing. And um, yeah, if you're in Rhode Island, he's in Newport, go see him. Totally worth it. And he understands this stuff deeply. Dude knows kinesiology far more than I do. It's really impressive. What else we got? John, is it possible to shred fat and also continue to get stronger and build muscle mass? Do two protocols contradict each other? Uh, no, they really don't. Um, they don't if handled properly. So it depends. It's <laughs> always, right? It depends. It's nuanced. Um, extremes. There's extremes. There's I want muscle growth at all costs. I want to gain as much muscle as humanly possible, which is where I did my Clovis mass gains protocol, which I can give to you, right? But I put on 10 pounds of lean mass in six weeks and I put on eight pounds of body fat in six weeks. Now I lost the eight pounds of body fat one week later. So it was totally worth the net gain of 10 pounds of lean muscle, but that's very extreme, right? Then there is the other extreme of a massive caloric deficit and trying to burn as much body fat as humanly possible. Then there is the in-between. And this is what you and I talked about uh, today in the group, John. Um, I taught you how to do this today, this morning. Um, I didn't spell it out for you in that way. But if you are only spiking insulin and spiking mTOR in a post-workout window, and then the rest of your day you are living Clovis and you're really managing insulin and glucose levels, and your caloric intake is correct, then you're not going to have any problems. You're going to burn body fat and you're also going to gain muscle. So what happens in the body? We have a fasted state and we have a storage state. That's it. So people, what's crazy, what's crazy to me about these bodybuilders and stuff is like, I went on a six week gain cycle or, or uh, what do they call it? I can't remember what they call it. Uh, I'm losing my, my, my body builder mentality. They have like a, a I don't know. They go in cycles. There's like a cut phase and a gain phase or whatever. Like every, every spring, all the bodybuilders are doing their cut phase. Right. And then, Oh, bulking, bulking, like dirty bulks. So like I'm going to eat Burger King and dirty bulk. That's what they call it. The, the bulking. So they do a bulk phase, dirty bulk, whatever. But what's crazy is they're like, I'm going to do a six week bulk and then a six week shred. You can do a shred and a bulk in the same 24 hour window. Just manage insulin. Right. So it's like storage state fasted state, right? When you're fasting, you have to be burning something for energy. Try to make sure that that is body, body fat by managing carbohydrates. In this storage state, then if you're technically at a caloric surplus, people look at everything in 24 hour windows and say, I need a, a caloric surplus if I want to build muscle. Yeah. I mean, for sure you want to eat a caloric surplus, but what calories are you eating? What types of calories are you eating? If you're eating a bunch of, you know, um, high glycemic, fast absorbing carbohydrates all day long, you are going to gain body fat 100%. Or even like me, I was utilizing carb backloading, spiking insulin, mTOR directly after a workout, but I was still taking in like 200 grams or 250 grams of carbohydrates a day. So I put on eight pounds of fat, right? But I also put on 10 pounds of lean muscle mass in six weeks, doing two workouts a week for 15 minutes. That's astonishing, everybody. It's mental right? So John, what you're looking for here is the holy grail of physique. All you need to do is lift heavy ass weights and only base virtually, this is super simplified, but virtually only eat carbohydrates in a post-workout window. Use high glycemic carbs, like a super ripe banana or white rice or something like that. And you only need a little bit of it, 20 to 40 grams, really, if you want to just get that little insulin spike and then eat a shitload of protein. Boom. There you go, dude. Now, it's going to take time that way. It's not going to be like my mass gains. You're not going to gain the same amount of muscle that I did in six weeks doing it this way, right? Maybe you'll gain six pounds in six weeks. Still pretty awesome, dude. If you're losing body fat at the same time, I ran a mass gains protocol with my dad when he was 50, 58 years old, and he gained six pounds of muscle and lost four pounds of body fat in the same 30-day window, right? You could definitely do it 100%. It's just a matter of knowing how to tweak and, body, and biohack this stuff. 
What else we got? Brittany, would you recommend anything different or additional from what you normally prescribe diet exercise for people with hypothyroidism? Yeah, eat more food. <laughs> um, for sure. Now, and now it doesn't go against what I prescribe normally because if you come to me and you get a custom macros plan, I'm going to give you a proper caloric intake. Now, most women, generally speaking, are not eating a proper caloric intake when they come to me, when they need my help and they come to me as a new client. And hypothyroid is, I mean, it's micronutrient deficiency. I, I, I'm telling you right now, like if you have hypothyroid, this is simply an issue of a micronutrient deficiency. You're not giving the body what it needs, right? And namely, number one, protein. So carnivores of the world, unite and be happy about this next 30 seconds is you really need to increase your protein intake for sure. So yeah, that's the only really advice I would give you, but you could follow the same advice I just gave for doms too, of saying you're going to eat 0 0.8 to 1.0 grams of protein per pound of body weight each day. If you just did that, I bet you could get some serious function back and you need to remove known triggers for things like autoimmune condition, because one could argue that hypothyroidism also has an immune response built into it that is causing things to get worse, right? When people talk about adrenal fatigue and thyroid and all these things, there's usually some kind of autoimmune uh, response at play. So grains, dairy, uh, gluten, all these kinds of things, a lot of sugars, these things are going to cause problems for you. So no, I still, to answer your question directly, no, I still just recommend diet and exercise. Um, but you need to be really consistent. You need to be consistent and you need to make sure you're getting enough micronutrients. Micronutrients are very, very important for hypothyroidism. So that's the other thing is people want to lose a bunch of weight as quickly as possible. So they take on these massive caloric deficits. Like their, you know, their BMR might be 1400 calories a day. And they're like, I'm going to eat 900 calories a day because that's my, and it's like, no, 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 no. BMR is at rest. If you're laying on the couch doing nothing, just breathing, that's how many calories you need right? So you got to take into account all these things. And when I make these plans, that's what I do. But hypothyroidism, yeah, generally speaking, is you're dealing with an autoimmune response and probably micronutrient deficiency. So definitely think about that. And gram per gram, the most nutrient dense foods on planet earth are animal proteins, technically animal organs, but animal proteins are right there as well. So that's what you want to do. What else we got here? Um, yeah, speaking of animal proteins, this question is kind of cool. If making a switch to exclusively grass-fed slash pasture-raised is cost prohibitive and one needs to include some grain-fed meats in their meals, does it make more sense to use the leaner cuts of meat and supplement fat from better sources like avocado, etc.? So there's a lot to untangle here. Lots to untangle because I can see what's happening in the person's brain. So we're going to untangle that in the back end. So I'm going to answer your question directly. And I'm going to tell you how you're looking at finances that might be tripping you up. Um, so first things first, grass-fed versus grain-fed, pasture-raised, grass-fed, grass, there's grass-fed and grain finish, there's grass-fed, grass finish, there's grass-fed, there's grain-fed. Actually, even feedlot cattle that are grain finished are usually, usually live the majority of their life on some, on grass. And then they move into a feedlot operation and they get pumped full of corn and antibiotics and hormones and all the scary stuff. So this is the idea that hormones, antibiotics, all these things are stored in the fat of the animal. These are things that are fat soluble. Toxins, generally speaking, are fat soluble. So what people get concerned about is if I'm eating grain fed meat, do I want to avoid the fat? The answer is, yeah, you could for sure. It's not a terrible idea. Um, the other answer is it's probably not going to kill you. Now, this is tricky because I want you to eat grass-fed and pasture-raised whenever you can. That's what I eat, 100% grass-fed, pasture-raised animals. I know the farmer. We get it here in Tennessee. It's beautiful, right? Cost me about six fifty dollars a pound. Um, so would I prefer you eat that way? Yeah, for sure. You're going to get more omega-3s, but slightly more omega-3s. You're going to get less omega-6, but slightly less omega-6. You're going to get a bit more of certain vitamins, but only a bit more of certain vitamins. Like the nutrition profile is not staggeringly different. Now this toxin piece is a little bit different because yes, toxins are fat soluble, but I would argue that you're not going to get them in high enough doses to really worry about this. The, the number one argument for grass fed pasture raised really is a sustainability play or a regenerative agriculture play or an environmental play, right? Because buying power is a very serious thing. So if you keep buying grain fed, which most people are buying grain fed, the production of grain fed continues. You feed this supply demand machine. This is economics, right? So there's the ethical treatment of the animal. There's the environment, which is a huge problem. We need to get rid of these feedlot operations. You do not want to be supporting feedlot. That's the real issue, right? But all that said, if it's a choice between not buy the beef 
or buy the beef, buy the grain-fed beef. If price is the only thing holding you back, buy the grain-fed beef and feed it to your family and don't think about it, don't worry about it, don't think about the fat, don't go crazy, like, don't think about it. Just boom. It's, it, trust me, it's better than the Cracker Jacks or the Cheetos or the whole milk, the feedlot whole milk or the cheese that you're buying. It's better than that, right? Anything is better than the standard American diet. So if you tell me that, hey, my family's eating beef, you know, every day and it's grain fed, it's like, cool, that's, that's actually a check mark in the win column for sure. I think it's a check mark in the win column. Now, let me help you think about this a little bit differently because here's the problem that I see with this question is the idea of what if I buy uh, leaner, not cheaper, what if I buy, yeah, you would be buying cheaper cuts of meat because it's grain fed, but, but, right? If you're gonna say to me, I'm gonna buy leaner cuts of beef because I'm buying grain fed and I'm going to make up the difference in fat with foods like avocado, you are going to spend way more money than if you just bought grass fed beef. This is also what drives me crazy about the ketogenic community, like the keto community, like the lower protein and have most of your calories come from fat, this whole thing, right? is they're constantly buying these sources of fats, right? It's like, I need my MCT oil, I need my brain octane, I need my grass-fed butter, I need my coconut oil, I need my macadamia nuts, I need my avocados, I need all of these things to get fat. The perfect ratio of fat to protein exists in red meat, boom. Like a marbled ribeye steak, it's like a one for one gram for gram protein to fat ratio. That's perfect, that's what you wanna be eating, right? So if you think about it, if you remove some of these supplemental fats, grass-fed beef is actually probably the most economic way for you to do this, the cheapest way for you to do this. So I want you to think about this. If you're looking at you know, grass, a pound of grass-fed beef is let's say $6.99, and the grain-fed beef is $4.99 or $3.99 or something like that. But you're going to go buy a, a 10-ounce bag of macadamia nuts that depending on where you are is probably freaking 12 bucks. Macadamia nuts are insanely expensive, right? And then avocados where I am, avocados are 99 cents a piece. And I'll eat one of those things in a split second, right? So you gotta, you're going to eat a $1 avocado with every meal to make up the fat difference or you're going to get macadamia nuts. It's like why not skip the macadamia nuts and get – pecans or walnuts, which are like easily three to $4 cheaper per bag, then you get the pound of grass-fed beef. You see what I'm saying? So the, the way that this, this question is framed is beautiful. Thank you for asking it this way. Thank you for typing it out this way because people don't think about these things. Their brains just play tricks on themselves. They're like, well, I need to get this fat. And this keto world has told you that you need the butter and the coconut oil and the avocados and the macadamias and all this stuff, right? You need all these supplemental fats. You're ta basically taking fat like a supplement at that point, or you just have this grass fed beef that has the fat built into it. It's actually much, much cheaper to do it this way, right? It's a little less variety. Yeah, but we're not talking about variety right now. You're telling me that it's cost prohibitive. So that means there's a budget issue here at play. So the question becomes, do you wanna spend more money on delicious avocado and delicious grass-fed butter and delicious macadamia nuts that are wonderful and all these things and give yourself more variety and it's amazing, or do you wanna save money and buy the grass-fed beef? Does that make sense? It, I, I, I think I made that clear. I hope so. So it's, al it's always, grocery budget is always the reallocating of funds. Where can you save? Where can you spend? What makes the most sense? Now, nutrient density wise, if you're getting your fat from that meat, you're going to consume far more micronutrients than if you're getting the fat from avocados and macadamia nuts and uh, coconut oil and grass-fed butter you're not gonna get nearly the same nutrient density that you would if you were eating the grass-fed beef. And I assure you, the grass-fed beef price difference is going to be cheaper than all of these supplemental fats that people are putting in their diet. So to answer your question directly, no, it doesn't make sense to buy leaner cuts of meat and make up the fat difference with plant fats. It, it just doesn't make sense. Does that make sense? <laughs> I hope that makes sense. I'm just kind of ranting now. But anyway, uh, I was really excited about this question to, to kind of get to spell that out. So let's take a look at some comments here. Brittany, and I definitely have the autoimmune responses to all those things. Yeah, exactly. So Brittany, um, I mean, one, you just need Clovis for sure. And then we talk about micronutrient deficiencies, which if you have hypothyroid, you're probably dealing with some kind of micronutrient deficiency. 
Judy, I find the grocery stores are obtaining more grass-fed beef. Yes, absolutely. I mean, for example, Walmart is now like the biggest seller of organic foods in the country, right? And Walmart at my house has grass-fed beef, wild-caught fish. They have organic produce, um, Kroger, grass-fed beef, all these things. But again, you got to be, you know, is it the most wonderful grass-fed beef? Should you be getting it from a local farm? Preferably a local farm, for sure, you know. But anyway, yeah, Mike, organic avocados, $2.39 each by me. Yeah, you're not going to save any money getting rid of grass-fed beef and eating avocados. That's not going to happen, right? I'm starving. I need beef now. Uh, you're never starving, Mike. You've never been starving. You're not starving now. Stop using the word starving, okay? <laughs> you got to stop that. Travis, I see what you mean about the budgeting with regard to supplemental fats. You've just got me eating so much protein. Yeah, for sure, dude. And okay, so let's let's see this here. I've got eating so much protein. How do you feel? How do you feel right now, brother? How do you feel compared to before you started Clovis? And then we just think about, is this better or is this worse? So it's basically reframing the entire conversation and saying, okay, like, yeah, you're eating a lot of protein. Do you feel wonderful? Yeah, I know because you've already told me. So I know what you're going to say here because we've already had this conversation. So you're feeling great. You're feeling great. Your performance is up. Your lifts are up. You feel better. You're, you're eating more calories than you've ever eaten and losing body fat, right? All these things are amazing. So it's just, you're figuring it out. You're just optimizing and making things better and better and better, right? So yeah, protein can get expensive for sure. But when you compare it comparatively, it's actually not that expensive. It's the same way that like, if you were a person like you're Travis, this is totally different. You're Clovis, right? So if you were a person on a standard American diet, I've done this spiel a million times where I'm like, people think I'm trying to increase their grocery budget. I'm not. It's you have a $300 grocery budget. And then I come along and say, well, you're buying beef and I need you to buy grass fed beef. And you're like, well, now my grocery budget's $310. Well, no, because you're Clovis now. So you're getting rid of the milk and the cheese and the Doritos and the Oreo cookies and the sugary cereals and the bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. So this budget is actually now down to $100 because you removed all the junk. You got an extra $200 to play with to buy that grass fed beef. So that's what I say in regards to a family just eating a typical standard American diet and buying a bunch of junk food, which is what everybody does. Just look around at somebody's grocery cart the next time that you're shopping and you'll see exactly what I mean with the Hawaiian punch and the Capri Sun and the whatever the hell, the powdered donuts, right? So that's what I say to people that are eating standard American diet. But the same reallocation of funds rings true in Clovis clients, right? So that's what you got to think about. People get excited about variety. I don't get this. I eat the same four to eight foods every single day. I don't care. That's actually a question that I had. That's another AMA question is, um, I've heard you say you eat the same thing every day, but I hear from other people that I need variety. Sure, you could, but you don't need it. You absolutely don't need it. Trust me, there were no ancestral hunter-gatherers that had grocery store selections of food. That has never been a thing, ever, okay? And I get it. People talk about the gut microbiome. Keep in mind, we know nothing about the gut microbiome. We know nothing, nothing about the gut microbiome, nothing about gut bacteria. We still don't understand it. The first human genome was not even mapped until 2002, and it turns out that bacteria plays a giant role in epigenetics and all these things. It's a huge, giant mess that we haven't even begun to scratch the surface on. So it's become this thing of like, eat all the colors of the rainbows with your vegetables. So now people are eating like peppers and eggplant and all these nightshades and all this nonsense, right? It's like, stop it. You don't need to do that. No, in my opinion, again, you're listening to my content. So this is my opinion. No, I am perfectly fine with people eating the same things over and over and over and over. And the question was, does the body get used to it? Yeah, of course it should. You're just giving the body healthy whole foods, right? Now, if you were eating like pop tarts and bagels, and brown rice every day, no, you can't eat that every day. Like that's gonna cause real, real problems, you know? But if you're talking about like, like I eat the same, I eat like ground beef and I eat eggs and broccoli and avocado and paleo powder, you know what I mean? Like I eat like the same exact things. I literally just eat the same things. It's a matter of convenience here, right? So think about it. If you have this giant variety, you need variety. People feel stressed out by the variety. That's where they end up like snacking and eating things that they shouldn't. And oh, I'm supposed to eat all the colors of the rainbow. So I'll just eat this. Like it leads, it's self-sabotage in my opinion. But again, that's, that's just me. And it's freaking overwhelming. You ever actually go to the grocery store and be like, I'm going to eat all the different colors. Good luck finding really good organic produce of all the different colors without spending a fortune 
And if you want to get that fresh produce and stick it all in your fridge, half of it's probably going to go bad before you even eat it. If you're anything like me, that's why I only buy, I only buy frozen organic vegetables. I only buy frozen. And any time I buy fresh produce, it dies somehow, right? I just don't get to it or whatever. So that's why I only buy frozen. So this whole eating the variety thing is, is just, it's so tricky. It's like too much in my opinion. I, I think it's too much. So anyway, uh, I totally lost my train of thought because I was went into that whole thing about eating all the different foods. I eat the same foods over and over and over, and I have success with my physique and my health and my performance and everything I want, and I've been doing that for a long time, right? John, I like the beef cooked well done. Is that a bad thing? Yeah, I would argue that it is. Um, I don't like to – if you cook it well done, you're going to lose micronutrients for sure. Like you're absolutely going to cook out some micronutrients. Um, the most micronutrient meats are consumed would, would be to consume them raw, right? Um, but food safety and all that stuff. So yeah, the more you cook it, the less micronutrients you're going to get for sure. What else we got? Judy, I eat seven different items within the week. Chicken, beef, shrimp, and bacon, cauliflower, broccoli, and eggs. Perfect. Love it. That's fantastic, right? What else we got here? Okay. So Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember what I was getting to. We were talking about uh, money, and I did have somebody ask me in the AMA because I did a live video. I've done a couple live videos about finance now. So I'm just going to share this with you guys real quick because we only got a couple minutes left. So um, there is a book. It is the single best book on finance that I've ever read. Now, granted, I have read like Money Master the Game and Unshakable and all these big Tony Robbins books about how to invest in the stock market and learn all about the stock market and learn all this stuff, blah, blah, blah. Books for rich people, right? So this is the best book I have ever read on finance and I have read a boatload of books on finance. This is the best, most practical step-by-step -step book on personal finance I have ever read and it has the cheesiest title of all time, the same way I think The 4-Hour Workweek is one of the best books of all time with the cheesiest title of all time. This book is called I Will Teach You to Be Rich by Ramit Sethi, uh, Ramit Sethi, and definitely check it out. I just put it in the comments there. Click that link. It's absolutely amazing. So whoever asked that question, who was the guy I was talking about? I think it was Mike that asked the question. Um, yeah, click on that. Buy that book. Best $10 you'll ever spend in terms of managing your personal finances. All right, what else we got here? Okay, so this is the one. I got, I got to touch on this. I have to. So I was given a question that I thought long and hard about answering. And I put a post in the groups today that said, you guys are trying to get me assassinated with these questions. But I think it's important to dive into, and I wanna dive into it. And I'm gonna preface this question by saying, I am not a doctor. I do not pretend to be a doctor. I will never be a doctor. I'm not in medical school. I am not giving you medical advice. I have never given you medical advice. I'm not telling you what to do with your family. I would never tell you to do what to do with your family. I don't have kids. I am not a parent. I have done neither yes nor no on this particular topic. I, no experience here, right? Not an expert. Let's dive in, everybody. You know it's a good question when we start with that. I'm going to read you the question. This may be a touchy subject, but how do you feel about vaccinations? Dun, dun, dun. I already gave you a medical disclaimer, right? So first things first, I'm going to dance around this a little bit because it's really the only way to talk about vaccinations is to dance around it a little bit. I was going to avoid it altogether, um, but again, you guys listen to me because I'm genuine and I speak my mind and I don't bullshit ever. So I think this is a really sticky, messy situation. And I think it's sticky and messy because I think people don't think things through and they operate on emotions and not data. And it's really, really tricky. So with that said, let's dive in. So I want to start this by saying that I had a, 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 an interesting conversation recently, which was a little concerning. So this was a person that wanted nutrition. I, I I don't, I won't go into details, but this person was asking me for nutrition advice. This person was in a very unhealthy place. They needed help with their health. They didn't really know what they were doing in terms of nutrition, fitness, health, wellness, all these things. And in our exchanges about nutrition and wellness, they just kind of did this like, yeah, and I bet you're super against vaccinations too. And I was like, well, my opinion is, is nuanced on vaccinations as I think everyone's opinion on this should really be nuanced. And the response I got was like kind of scathing. It was just this like, um, well, I hope that someday you do the research uh, so you can make up your mind on this. Or like it, basic, paraphrasing, it was basically like, you need to research because I'm right and you're wrong. And I was like, huh, 
okay, so apparently this person has never consumed any of my content ever because if you guys have consumed my content, you know how I feel about average everyday people, particularly those that are that are struggling with this this health and wellness space, talking about this this research stuff, you know, because most people are are doing a Google search and screenshotting the first search result and saying, I researched this and this is my opinion and it's 100% true. Right? And I struggle with that. I struggle with that like crazy. I have trouble being nice about it. I'm just like, oh, like I really have trouble with this. So let's dive into this topic. Now, here's my truthful opinion on this. My 100% truthful opinion on vaccinations is drum roll, boom. There is simply not enough science to have a 100% definitive opinion on this. There isn't. There is not enough science to have a 100% definitive opinion on this. I'm saying that again, repeating it so you understand what I'm saying. There's not enough science to have a 100% definitive opinion on this. What I mean by that is A, all vaccines are good. B, all vaccines are terrible and will kill you. This is not black or white, right? There just isn't enough science there. Now, if you claim that you know the truth, 100% blanket statement across the board, you're being dishonest. You're, you're just being dishonest. That's all there is to it. So let's explore this a little bit. Again, I am no expert, but if we were to remove all the emotion, remove the basically religious dogma, it's like vegans versus carnivore. There's so much emotion there that you're never going to get proper answers. The emotion is too strong. It's too overwhelming, right? So if we remove all the emotions from this, we examine this thing logically, right? With an open mind, you'll see that the whole thing is a shade of gray. It is not black or white. It just isn't. Okay. So let's answer a few questions. One, do vaccines work? Polio, anyone? No, no polio. So yes, vaccinations work. They absolutely do. Certain illnesses that used to be huge problems have been eradicated. Vaccinations play a giant role in that. So yes, vaccinations work. Okay, question one. Question two, do all vaccines work? Nope, not even a little bit. Even just the flu vaccine fails miserably. Oftentimes we'll have flu outbreaks with like the largest numbers of people getting flu vaccines ever. There'll still be a flu outbreak. So it's like, do all vaccines work? No. So do vaccinations work? Yes. Do all vaccinations always work? No. Do vaccinations hurt people? Yes, 100%. Irrefutably, in some cases, some of the time. Details matter. Details matter. Details matter. Do vaccinations hurt people? Yes, irrefutably, in some people, some of the time. Now, this happens often enough. There's actually a, there's an entire fund for this. I don't know if you guys realize this, but there's a fund called the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program. Listen to that name again, the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program. What is this? This is literally a fund set up specifically to pay out families whose children have been severely injured by common vaccinations. Common vaccinations cause so many problems that they have an entire compensation fund that's basically just there to handle payouts. We're really sorry that we messed your kid up. Here's some money. We hope this helps. Okay. This is an actual thing. Google it. The vaccine injury compensation program, real thing. Okay. So think about it. We've now talked about vaccinations for all of, I don't know, 90 seconds. And we have checks in the pro column and we have checks in the con column. If we were doing a pros and cons list, there's checks in both. Okay. It's very gray right now. Very, very gray right now. So the other issue that I see is using this term vaccinations as a blanket term, meaning all vaccinations always, right? That's not, we can't think about it this way. So here's the way that my brain thinks about it. There are vaccinations that are incredibly well studied and have been around for a very, very long time that have been around for decades, which means you have far more millions, if not billions of people that have received those vaccinations, a much larger data set to pull from to manage to, to really examine the safety and the efficacy of these things. So there are some that have been around for a long time. Here's what I suggest. Well, no, never mind. I don't suggest this. I'm not giving advice on this. I refuse to give advice on this, right? The way that I would look at it, an easy way for me to look at it is what vaccinations did my parents get? That's how I like to look at this, right? 
So those are by default, again, going to have way more people that have had them and had way more research behind them because they've been around for so much longer. So when you stop and look at the schedules of these vaccinations, right? Like when my parents were born, my parents were born in 1959. At the time, there was like a total of eight vaccinations. I think it was eight. But the thing is, a lot of these vaccinations are given in combination. They were given in combinations then, they're given in combinations now. So if we look at when my parents were born, 1959, they probably got like five vaccinations because there was eight of them, let's say, and then some were in combination. Now, at maximum, by the time my parents were two years old, they would have gotten eight total shots, okay? Keep those numbers in mind. We'll say five vaccinations, they would have gotten eight total shots by age two. Today, there are 14 recommended vaccinations and children can easily get 26 shots by age two. 26 needles with vaccinations by age two. The dosages have also gone up, right? So we have these really aggressive, what they call scheduling, vaccination schedules, right? They've gotten really, really aggressive, okay? Now, to make things even more confusing, these vaccination schedules are different all around the world. Europe's vaccination schedules, one, they do like legally require, they like impose vaccinations on people, which I think is kind of messed up. But um, their vaccination schedule is completely different than here. Completely different. How can that be? Like there's scientists in Europe and there's scientists in America and the, reg the, the, the recommendations are completely different, right? Why is that? Because scientists don't know 100% how to handle vaccinations. If the scientists don't know, your friend at the PTA meeting doesn't know. Okay, that's, that's just the way it is. So it, it's undecided, everybody. So my only, the only thing that I would do, if this were me, is I would simply use caution. First things first, I would tell everybody around me to shut the hell up before I backhand them because I'm probably tougher than they are. <laughs> if I'm at the PTA meeting, let's be honest, right? You got to put on blinders, everybody. Put on blinders. You got your kids. You got your family. This is all about you. Okay. It's all about you. Really. It really is. And then people get into, well, take your unvaccinated kid into my school and blah, 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 right. It gets really messy. It's basically a political debate at this point. Dogma, dogma, religion, religion, everybody screaming at each other. Okay. So what I'm thinking about from my perspective is I would use caution, right? I would never tell you what to do with your kids, but if I had kids, I would really give some serious thought to the vaccinations that are very well studied, that have been around for a long time, that are well understood, that are proven to be safe, and I would probably get those vaccinations. I might, get, I'm, I might use a vaccination schedule from 1959. I might just do that, right? I can't say I don't have kids. I don't know for sure what I would do, but that's something I would consider. That seems a little bit safer than the super aggressive stuff that we have now, okay? So I do also think that it's quite irresponsible to take the maximum doses, the most aggressive schedule and just shove all that into a three month old. I don't think that that is responsible. I also don't think it's responsible to run around and say things like vaccinations cause autism. I don't think that's responsible. So again, these crazy extremes, right? I just talked about it teaching John Balcazar how to, how to gain muscle and lose weight. There's always extremes and the extremes are extreme for a reason right? Where's the in-between? What's the gray area? The gray area is probably the safest bet for John with muscle gaining and building and losing fat. The in-between, that's the safe bet. It's not extreme. That's the best place for him to go. Generally speaking, the middle is pretty awesome, okay? Outside of the extremes, the middle is pretty awesome. So we just don't have enough data to say these things that people are saying. Like, into, like that one of the biggest studies that they've ever done of all time on this showed that actually unvaccinated kids we're at a higher risk of autism. There's plenty of kids that have autism that didn't receive any vaccinations. Now, here's where this conversation is gonna go off the rails and people are gonna hate me, okay? Everybody is looking for a smoking gun all the time. We're looking for a smoking gun. Now, when we look for smoking guns, oftentimes humans are trying to take responsibility off themselves. They're trying to remove personal responsibility. So it's the same way that I tell people Hey, you don't need acai berry from the jungle to add to your standard American diet to make you healthy. You just need to eat a healthy diet in general, right? But people are always looking for the smoking gun. What's the magic pill that can fix me? What's the smoking gun that causes this problem? So it becomes this thing of like vaccinations cause autism, right? In my mind, if we were looking for a smoking gun, I would start with the fact that epigenetics play a huge role in our health. And there are transgenerational problems that are handed down generation to generation based on lifestyle, dietary habits, 
lifestyle habits, all these things get passed on to children. So if we were really looking for a smoking gun, I would want to start with the fact that women my age, people having kids now or had kids a few years ago or are going to have kids in a few years. I'm 32 years old, right? So people that are my age, we grew up with the food pyramid. We grew up eating the standard American diet for decades. Then women get pregnant and all of society says obnoxious shit to them like, well, now you're eating for two. Here's five more pieces of cheesecake and husband brings home a pint of Ben and Jerry's every single night because they're having cravings and they eat 17 Hershey bars and blah, 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 right? This is far more of a smoking gun in my opinion. Again, in my opinion, I'm not an expert, I'm not a doctor, not any of those things. This is far more of a smoking gun for learning disabilities, ADHD, autism, autoimmune conditions, seasonal allergies, all of these things. Far more of a smoking gun. We're dealing with horrific dietary choices throughout the entire labor process, not labor process, uh, uh, pregnancy. Horrific, horrific dietary choices throughout the entire pregnancy. And then we're like, you can't make it a vaccine. It's totally that. And then we talk about C-sections and breastfeeding and all these things. It gets really crazy, right? And these reasons, I know a lot of women can't breastfeed. Why? Why did that just magically happen? How, how come now we have an epidemic of women who can't breastfeed? We have an epidemic of women who can't give natural childbirth. We have all these epidemic, 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 epidemic. The smoking gun is the bullshit diet. You see what I mean? Now, I am not saying, I am, I am not saying that vaccinations don't cause autism definitively. I don't know that. I don't have the data to say that. I'm not saying that it does cause autism. I don't have the data to say that, right? I'm not saying that all vaccinations are good. I'm not saying that all vaccinations are bad. Again, I'm somewhere in the middle on this thing. I really don't know. I'm not an expert. But I really just wish that we could have these conversations and remove the emotion from them. Because I've, I've given that little speech right there before that the the what women are eating during pregnancy and the two or three decades before they got pregnant, what they were eating that whole time matters. It significantly matters what your metabolic health is when you enter into pregnancy and throughout the pregnancy, right? That matters. But I say that and people get super mad at me, super mad at me. And I get it because I'm never going to be pregnant. I don't know what those hormones do to your brain. I don't know how the mood swings happen. I don't know what kind of cravings you have. I don't know any of that. I never will know it. So I'm not saying I'm not blaming you. I'm not saying I don't have empathy. I have a tremendous amount of empathy. I would never want to go through childbirth. I am not strong enough. I'm telling you as a human to carry something in my body for nine months and deal with all that stuff. I'm not blaming anybody. Okay. But it is concerning to me that we grasp at these things. We want this smoking gut. I blame you, Mr. Doctor, because blah, 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 blah. And you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I've known your kid for like three months and you've been eating this way for 30 years before this whole pregnancy thing happened, you know? So, and again, there are people that are gonna watch this and it's gonna hit something in them. They're gonna be like, this guy is a dickhead, right? But that's not what it is, man. I love you guys. I want you guys to be super happy. I want your kids to be super happy. I want your kids to be super healthy. I want you to be able to prevent these things before they happen. Okay? You see what I mean? And of course, I'm also not saying that lifestyle design is going to prevent autism. Don't, don't put words in my mouth there either. Don't twist any of this around. I'm not even giving you advice. I'm just talking, guys. I'm just talking on my own podcast right now. That's what's happening. So this is so freaking nuanced, everybody. It's so nuanced. And it's the dogma and the religion and the problems. That, that, that's where the problems come from. This dogma, the religion, people screaming at it, screaming at each other, screaming at the internet, fighting in freaking comment threads, right? Like if I ran this as a Facebook ad, do you know how much hate I would get? It'd be astonishing. It'd be probably the most amount of hate I've ever gotten on the internet. Why? Why can't we have a conversation like this? I'll give you an example. How come we can't say that inner cities with higher crime rates and more behavior problems those kids aren't eating well. How come we can't say that? It's like not allowed to talk about these things. There's so much that we can't talk about. Food plays a, you're literally made of what you eat. You eat stuff and then it turns into you. It turns into your tissues. It turns into your, your facial hair. It turns into your nails. You eat the stuff and it becomes you, <laughs> right? It's that freaking important. And we will sit here and argue about these things 
endlessly and scream at each other and hate one another. So then you get the two extremes, right? Like this is what it, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, guys, but what'll happen is it's like, oh, you didn't vaccinate your kid. You probably live in a Volkswagen van down by the river and you're a dirty hippie and you don't wear deodorant and your kid sleeps in a tent and you homeschool him and you're an anarchist, right? And then you get your kid all of the vaccinations and you're somehow a Nobel Prize winning scientist who probably lives in a fancy suburb with a $400,000 house. How did we get here? How did we get here? That, that you just assume shit about people. This is awful, everybody. We're really in a bad place in America, like uh, in terms of this, and, and we're actually in a better place than we've ever been, you know, where uh, less people are poor, less people are starving, there's far less violence than there's ever been, believe it or not, contrary to mainstream media, everything is better. There's more equality than there's ever been, blah, blah, blah. So we make up shit to fight about. We just start screaming at each other over nothing. And it's because we're not face to face. There are very few people in this life that I've met that will scream at me face to face. It just doesn't happen. Just doesn't happen. I one kid messaged me the other day. He was like 17 years old. Like all of his pictures are shirtless. And I had that 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 um that ad I had that says like, hey, exercise has almost nothing to do with fat loss. And I just get this tons of horrific words I can't even repeat. Like, you're a P word, you're an effing P word, bro. You can't even lift, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> and that's what we're dealing with with the internet. This child, this 17-year-old, would never say that to me in person. Never in a million years. Even if he did, I wouldn't do anything to him. I'm not that kind of guy. But like, it would be hilarious to watch that communication go down. It'd, it'd be hysterical. Like, I would probably really enjoy that. You know, I wouldn't hurt the kid. But it'd be an interesting conversation. So it's like we're not allowed to have interesting conversations anymore. Which is, it's not. It's it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. John, because you need facts and knowledge to have a conversation. Yes, 100%. The media, social especially. Yes, social media and mainstream media. If you're, if you're so, uh, I don't know how to say this to you guys. If you're still watching TV and you're still watching the news on TV, you got, you're getting brainwashed. It's, it's, it's horrific. There's no reason. No reason to put that in your life. T try a political detox, for real. All of you, try, try a politics detox for 10 days. Try a politics detox for 30 days and then go try to watch something like CNN or MSNBC or Fox News or any of those things and give it up for a few weeks and then go try to watch it and you're going to go, ugh, how did I ever watch this? This is insane, people. It's insane, right? And that's how we get here. I have to give you guys a 35-second introduction about how I'm not a parent and I'm not a mom and I'm not a doctor and I'm not an expert and I'm not this. Please don't be mad at me. I'm not a monster. But here's my opinion, everybody. And I'm a guy who tends to research stuff like a little bit. What are we doing, guys? You know, it shouldn't be these big, scary topics. It just shouldn't be big, scary topics. Kristen, I hate labels too. The only label I like is this one. Bam. I love this shirt. I wear this shirt all the time. Super comfy. Shout out to uh, Mary at Fat Fudge. All right. Um, anyway, we're going to end on that one. I'm going to end on the, the vaccinations question, which I'm actually quite glad that I tackled it. I hope that it was, um, I hope that it was a, a meaningful little spiel. If you guys liked it, click the like button, click the love button, let me know. Um, I know that there was a lot of love buttons going during me ranting about this thing. Um, but it really is. It's, it's so tricky. And um, it's all a little tricky. When I start talking about diet, too, there, there are women and moms who feel attacked. And that's, that's not the purpose of my conversation at all. It's not the purpose of my opinion, my conversation, what I'm saying. Not at all. It's like, hey, why don't we fix this together? You know, like, hey, have you ever thought about the fact that, like, you ate a lot of ice cream or whatever junk during your pregnancy, have you thought about that? And not sit back and think about it and dwell on it and beat yourself up, just kind of go, huh, yeah, I never really thought about that. Because, and you know all the marketing companies, everybody, brainwashing, 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 all the marketing companies, you're eating for two, you're eating for two, you're eating for two, you're eating for two. Yes, you are eating for two, so eat more ribeye. Eat more sweet potato. Eat more broccoli. You're eating for two. Yes, this is factual. Correct. That doesn't mean you need to double up on the standard American diet, right? Now you're killing two people instead of one. Where's the smoking gun? Right? Think about it. 
I think that's it, everybody. What else we got? You damn right. Thank you, Chris. Kira, Kira, I'm sorry, Kira. It's nothing but hate. Ah, uh, well, think about it, Laura. Um, the, oh, I think you're probably talking about the news. The news is 100. It's nothing but hate. Yeah, absolutely. But the social media thing's tricky too because this is social media, guys. We're on social media right now. I got a bunch of people who I've never met in real life. Some of you I have, but and you're giving me loves and heart buttons, and we're having a great conversation right now, and we're talking about things logically and having this great thing. And I got my optimism T-shirt on, and we're having fun, and I'm cracking jokes and telling you guys stuff that you may not have already known about doms and five by five and breaking parallel and I will teach you to be rich and finances and all this stuff. Social media is a, can be a beautiful, beautiful place. I mean, absolute beautiful place, you know? Mainstream media news outlets are all toxic, like 100% toxic. That's true. Um, but social media can be a beautiful place if you use it for love and gratitude and all those things, you know? Judy, I haven't watched the news in six months and I skip it on Facebook by scrolling. Perfect. Yeah. I've told you guys before on my desktop, I use Newsfeed Eradicator. I don't have a newsfeed on Facebook. Not interested. Don't want it. Not there. Um, all right. John, nothing but love for you. Nothing but love for you, brother. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. All right. I know a lot of you guys have questions and I did not get to all of them. Um, sorry about that. But we do an AMA every single week. That's what they're here for. Um, and again, there's so many newbies and everything. I think these these AMAs are really working well. I probably will do some whiteboard presentations again if I feel the need to do so, if there's a particular topic that I want to tackle. If there's a topic that you want me to tackle where you're like, hey, I would really like to understand this in depth, um, let me know what that is. So you can go to ama.imclovis.com. You can include your email. Please do, if you want a response from me, include your email. Just be like, hey, man, I'd really like to see a presentation on insulin, which I've covered a zillion times, but I'm just giving an example. Like, hey, man, I want to know, I want a master class on building bigger biceps. Can you do that AMA? Like, just send me all the questions. ama.iamclovis.com. Um, here, I'll put it in the comments right now. ama.iamclovis.com. Boom. There you go. Click on that, send me all the questions at any time, and I'll piece together these episodes the way I did. Like today, I kind of wanted to put five by five with and breaking parallel with DOMS, with the the meat question, how much meat should you take in, blah, blah, blah. I like to kind of get these questions ahead of time, and then all I'm doing is just stacking them. Like I'm, I'm going to do this question first, and this question second, and this question third, and it's really fun for me because I get to challenge myself of answering these questions live for you guys, but I also get to select the questions in a way that it makes a really valuable episode for you, if that makes sense. So it's something that I want to put concepts together that will help link together so you can remember more of this episode on one listen, just in case you don't go back and listen to the podcast or anything like that. So I'm trying to really, really help you guys absorb this stuff the best I can, right? Kira, yeah, it really sucks. People can't just do their own research. They'd rather just scream their opinion like it matters whatsoever. Yeah, and the, the other thing that's really tricky is it's, it's parroting. Like, I don't want you guys to parrot me. So that's why I, I didn't give you any direct advice there, right? I said like, well, if it was me, I would probably do this. And have you ever thought about this? And have you ever thought about this? This is how you get the wheels spinning and help people form their own opinions and maybe help them to go do more research. But the last thing I want you to do, and this is what other people do, is like they just hear some influencer say something and then they just repeat it like at the dinner table. No, did you know that 47% of everything is nonsense? Someone told me that. It's true. Heard it on Instagram. And then it's crazy. It's so crazy. Like, and really, I mean, people do this to me, actually send me screenshots <laughs> and I'll be like, you literally Googled the exact phrase that is your argument. You were like, Google my argument, X, Y, Z equals X, Y, Z, enter. And then the first search result, someone will screenshot it and send it to me and be like, see, told you. And I'm like, Oh my God, you think that's research. You actually really think in your brain that you just did research. You really think that. What are we dealing with? Wow, public school has failed us. <laughs> it's, just, it's insanity. It's absolute insanity, everybody. But anyway, I'm glad we can have nuanced conversations here. I feel really, really happy that... Um, We've built a community here, this Clovis tribe, where we can have these conversations where people don't tear each other's heads off, where people aren't super emotional, people aren't dogmatic and basically religious about these things. We can have real, genuine conversations. John, you got to go back and watch, buddy. I can't repeat this stuff for you. You got to go back, brother, or wait for the podcast. Sorry, dude. All right. Um, anyway, it's late now. This is AMA number 70. My name is Justin from Clovis.
that's where you are, everybody. Facebook.com slash the Clovis Culture. Click the share button. Share this on your timeline. Click the happy face, the love face, the wow face, the sad face, whatever you're feeling. All the emotions. All emotions are good. There are no bad emotions. So click on all the emotions. Let me know how you're feeling. Leave me some comments. If you like the podcast, send me an email. Send me an email, justin at iamclovis.com. If you enjoyed the episode, just let me know. Um, you guys would be surprised how meaningful that is. Like when I'm really in the thick of it and I'm you know working 10 to 12 hours a day on my computer and inevitably getting stressed out by work and blah, blah, blah. Feels really nice to come across those those little messages. Like, hey man, really dig what you're doing and keep doing it. And you know that AMA did really hit me because of X Y Z. Love those messages, and I always have time for them, and I always respond to them no matter how busy I am. So uh, thank you guys. This is AMA number seventy, and thank you for being here for seventy whole weeks. I love it. Seventy whole weeks, beautiful. So uh, thank you guys for being a part of this. And keep sending me questions, ama.iamclovis.com. This will be a podcast tomorrow. Check out clovis.show, clovis.show. Actually, here, I'm going to give you the uh, title of this right now, clovis.show slash Annika. Go check out Annika's episode because she's a badass and is awesome, and I love her for doing it. So uh, check out clovis.show slash Annika. Click on that link, and thank you guys for being here. Have an amazing night. Turn off the screens. Get some good quality deep sleep, everybody. I'll see you live in the Facebook groups tomorrow in the AM. Justin Null signing off. Love you guys. Good night. Bye.